Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Forest for the Birds webinar series. This is our first in a series of 12s. I'm Bob Ford. I'm the U.S. Coordinator for Partners in Flight and have been part of the team putting this together. I'll also be moder moderating the session today and monitoring the chat box for questions and comments for our speakers. Uh, first, though, we would like to have a brief overview and introduction Overview to WebEx and introduction to the webinar series by Shannon Connors at the National Conservation Training Center. Shannon, all yours. Bob, welcome everybody. Um, so to start off, the Forest for the Birds Conserving America's Forest webinar series is jointly sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center, Forest Ecology Working Group, and the Migratory Bird Program. And we'll share all this contact information in the chat box if you're interested in learning more about the Forest Ecology Working Group or if you'd like to receive continuing education credits for attending these webinars. And first, uh, just a quick disclaimer, this product is for educational purposes only. The views, opinions, or positions expressed in this webinar series are those of the guest speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or positions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of the Interior. Some of the materials and images may be protected by copyright or may have been licensed to us by a third party and are restricted in their use. Mention of any product names, companies, web links, textbooks, or other references does not imply federal endorsement. Well, welcome again, everybody. Still a lot of people coming into the room. Uh, there are, as thank you, Shannon, as you said, uh, continuing education credits available. And for that and other reasons, you might take a quick look here at the objectives of the series. And ho we hope that you sign up for all 12 or at least the ones uh, that you are able to attend and enjoy. It's my pleasure first to introduce Jerome Ford. Uh, Jerome has a distinguished career within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He started that career at, as a biologist on coastal refuges in the southeast. And he's worked his way up through the Fish and Wildlife Service and now holds a senior executive position of assistant director to migratory birds in the Washington, D.C. office for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. One of the things I admire about the Fish and Wildlife Service and other natural resource agencies is our ability to get career biologists into senior level positions. And Jerome is an excellent example. He, he definitely knows what it takes to be in the field to think about a project and what it has to, has to get done in order to get that project accomplished. Jerome, Jerome, we appreciate you joining us today and look forward to your open remarks. And Jerome will also introduce our main speaker. Jerome, all yours. Uh, thank you, Brother Bob. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Bob mentioned, my name is Jerome Ford. I'm the Assistant Director uh, for the Migratory Bird Program in the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd like to welcome you to the Forest for the Birds uh, webinar series, uh, kicking off today with Dr. Ken Rosenberg and continuing every month on the third Tuesday at 1 Eastern for the next 12 months. Overall, the 12 webinars in this series uh, broadly follow the logic of strategic habitat conservation uh, through partnership, conservation science, and forest management. The series tells a compelling story about forest bird population declines, uh, partnerships, opportunities, and forest management actions. This webinar series reflects one part of the Fish and Wildlife Service's response to the three billion birds lost paper published in Science by Rosenberg and all in 2019. The series focus is on forests and associated bird spe species where one third of the decline has occurred. Forest habitat management, including restoration and enhancement, is crucial to sustaining landscapes that support threatened, endangered, or at risk species, migratory birds, game species, and a host of other native flora and fauna. We appreciate the talented lineup of speakers willing to share their exper uh, expertise over the next 12 months. The first three webinars address the biological foundation of forest birds. The next three link large landscape conservation planning to stand specific actions. These are followed by examples and opportunities for implementation and a webinar on monitoring the results for stated objectives. Migratory bird conservation has been a foundational thread across the Fish and Wildlife Service since the roots of our beginning a responsibility entrusted to us through landmark legislation 
such as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The commitment to migratory bird conservation continues today with science-based decision-making, working through voluntary partnerships to conserve birds. This webinar series was developed by the Fish and Wildlife Service Ecology Working Group in partnership with the National Conservation Training Center and the Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Program and exemplifies that commitment. The Fish and Wildlife Service Forest Ecology Working Group purpose is to provide a coordinated approach to increase the understanding and integration of forest ecology, applied science, and forest habitat management principles across the service and with partners. We invite your participation in this working group through its forest ecology list serve or through direct engagement. Additional resources are under development to complement and further extend your opportunities to learn about birds and forest management. NCTC is developing a series of short seven minute or less videos that will provide more information and resources spe specific to forest types around the country. Partners in Flight is developing road shows for Western forests to provide opportunities for hands-on learning about various tools for conservation uh, of birds and forests. So enjoy, engage, ask questions for what you hear, try it in the field, monitor, adapt, and let's bring back as many of these birds as we can. It is now my greatest pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ken Rosenberg, Applied Conservation Scientist at Cornell Lab of Ornithology and American Bird Conservancy. Ken is the lead author of what has become popularly known as the Three Billion Birds paper published in Science in 2019. That paper has created a new energy and sense of urgency around conservation and today, Ken will tell us about forest bird population declines based on that paper and science and conservation actions needed to move forward. I give to you Dr. Ken Rosenberg. Thank you, Jerome, and <clears throat> thank you everyone for the uh, invitation and opportunity to kick off this webinar series. Um, so my job today is to set the stage for the webinar series by providing the doom and gloom portion, I guess, um, talking about the bird declines. And I'm going to start by highlighting uh, the results from the science paper that are most relevant to forest birds. So grassland birds and shorebirds have really been getting most of the attention so far. So it's sort of interesting focusing in on the forest bird issues. I'll also describe our more recent efforts to better understand the causes of declines and an approach for filling key knowledge gaps and advancing species towards recovering their populations, an approach that we call the road to recovery. And then I'm going to pose some challenging questions about why business as usual and conservation has not prevented the loss of 3 billion birds and some high level considerations for us to think about as we move into this new era of forest management for birds. So it's been a year and a half, it's hard to believe, since the publication of, of the science paper and the news of the, the net loss of 2.9 billion birds and more than 300 species in decline. And, and this was really the first time that we had attempted to combine long-term population trend data with our population size estimates for more than 500 bird species to evaluate this, whether there was this net change across the entire avifauna. So the publication succeeded in getting everybody's attention, as uh, Jerome has indicated, and this phrase, three billion birds, is now heard. I hear it at every meeting, uh, every scientific talk kind of opens, uh, opens with it. So that was really one of our hopes. And I still think that this is a moment in time for conservation, perhaps another moment like the publication of Silent Spring. It has the chance to help us change our societal consciousness and the way we professionals work to save birds and ecosystems. So my advancing is not working. So, so we broke down the, the loss uh, in, in this paper for, for groups of species in several ways, such as across major breeding habitats or biomes, which are shown on, on this slide with the inset map on, on the right. 
So on this slide, the absolute change in abundance for each biome is graphed in the left-hand panel, and the relative change in abundance is shown by the bars in the center. So when we look across biomes, we see that there was a net loss in nearly every habitat, including among generalists. And the largest loss, both in terms of absolute and relative loss, was in grassland birds, which are the gold colored lines, it was a loss of 700 million individuals, more than half of all grassland birds lost since 1970. We also estimated that the boreal forest, which is the dark green there, uh, has lost half a billion birds. And eastern and western forests um, had a similar overall decline in terms of absolute loss. So those are those middle uh, green lines there on, on the graph. I can't really uh, use a cursor. Um, but Western forests actually represented, that, that loss represented a greater proportional loss, uh, about 30% loss in Western forests, more than in Eastern forests. And the only biome to show a moderate increase was wetland birds, which are shown in blue. But as you can see, these don't even come close to compensating for the losses. And this is because wetland bird populations are much smaller than most terrestrial bird populations. So all wetland birds combined don't even add up to a single sparrow or a warbler or a bird like the American robin. So if we break the results down more finely by taxonomic bird families, we see that there are winners and losers. In this figure, the wheel graphs represent the absolute change in abundance within each family. So the red wheel for families that show a net loss in abundance and the blue wheel for families that show a net gain. And the cool thing is that the size of the wheels are proportional. So that there's a total loss of 3.2 billion birds, but a total gain of only 250 million. So a majority of the loss has occurred in several large bird families sparrows, warblers, blackbirds, although 38 families showed a net population loss and 10 families have lost more than 50 million individuals. On the gain side, 29 bird families showed a net gain and among the biggest winners are things like vireos and the waterfowl and raptors and woodpeckers. So uh, I think this is maybe the strangest result we found is this uh, increase we see across uh, vireos and bird like the red-eyed vireo, which is a, an abundant forest bird, but it migrates all the way to South America, winters in the Amazon basin. I mean, you would think it was a typical kind of neotropical migrant that should be declining, yet its population has uh, been steadily increasing over this uh, same time period. So there's, there's still a lot to learn about these birds. Perhaps the most surprising result, though, was um, that half of the total net loss in the avifauna was made up of 10 very common and widespread species. And uh, these are not necessarily the top 10, but uh, some of the forest birds, black pole warbler, dark-eyed junco, very thrush, rusty blackbird, they're examples of common forest birds that have lost tens or hundreds of millions of individuals. So bird population declines and loss are not just restricted to rare and threatened species, but are pervasive, pervasive among common and familiar species as well. So what are the primary causes of these declines? Well, our study didn't really specifically address the causes, and these are not easy to pin down for, for individual species. But we know from lots of other evidence that Habitat loss and degradation are the primary drivers of bird declines by far. And a common theme we saw across the largest declines, so grassland birds plus other common um, birds of open fields, open country, some of the blackbirds, is that these are birds associated with agricultural landscapes. So what we're seeing is this intensification of agriculture where not long ago there were fallow fields, grassy margins, hedgerows, tree rows. Now it's horizon to horizon cornfields or other crops, uh, and also more intensive use of more toxic pesticides. So this combined with urban sprawl, loss of tropical forests, where a lot of these birds are migrating in winter. So we're just seeing basically natural habitats squeezed out to the point where the lands, our landscapes cannot support basic bird populations.
And on top of this are the many human caused factors that we know kill huge numbers of birds. So these might not be the primary drivers of the declines, but they make it more difficult for birds to survive in the remaining habitats. And these are all things that we know we can do something about. We have proven solutions for minimizing this human caused mortality. But because the declines are so pervasive across so many habitats and groups of bird species, we know that these birds are facing multiple interacting threats. And many of these are still difficult for us to measure, such as pesticides, and not just in agricultural areas, but also spraying for forest pests, energy development, light pollution from cities, uh, or the increasing frequency of extreme weather, all of these being exacerbated, we think, by, by climate change. So that was a lot of doom and gloom. I think uh, we can pause now to see if there are any questions on the first part of the talk. Thanks, Ken. I'll remind folks they can put a question into the chat box or comments, and there are a couple there. And most, Ken, or a couple of questions here that both get at the same uh, issue, more or less, and that's uh, putting the context of 3 billion birds into total population. Can you express that as a percent of the total number of birds? And yeah, so it was about 29%. So our, our estimates is that there were roughly 10 billion birds at the start of the survey, our, our survey period, 1970. And and that was reduced by by about 30 percent, three billion. So, I mean, given given the accuracy of our estimates, at least that's the range that that we are talking about. And leading into your, I think we have time for one more question, then we'll get to the second part of your presentation, Ken. Um, and this kind of segues to your second part, I believe. Can you do you have an idea, any idea about how many people in the United States actually know about these declines? And there's a strong science communications effort associated with this. Yeah, well, there was a huge. Um, this was one of the really gratifying things. You know, we've some of the we've known birds have been declining. We've been saying some of these things for years and years, but this paper really got uh, the attention of the public and the media. I mean, we were in the front pages of the New York Times, Washington Post. Um, what was it? I think 1,800 media outlets covered the story and uh, with a reach of, of over 3 billion readers. So, um, you know, and we're getting, it's, it's the kind of thing where, yeah, your cousin calls you up and says, wow, you know, I've heard about these bird declines. So I think it is, the message is finally trickling, you know, to, uh, to real people and, and through the media. So we, we think that a lot of people are are now aware of this issue, this crisis. Thanks, Ken. Let's get back to your, your talk. And uh, we do have some links to post. Uh, Shannon will be helping us out there as we go through the next part. Ken, I think you have another 15 minutes or so, and then we will open it up and end our time on question and answer. So back to you. Yeah, thanks. So, so as I said, yeah, we were hoping that this paper and the response that it's gotten will continue to serve as a catalyst for change. And, uh, you know, so what are we going to do about this loss? That's the real question. Business as usual in bird conservation hasn't been working. We really need to reimagine um, what bird conservation is going to look like in, in the 21st century. So what does that actually mean to reimagine bird conservation? What we've been doing over the past 30 years, something is not really working. And the main thing is that we now need to be much more strategic and focused on where to implement conservation actions. We've been addressing mostly broad scale threats, habitat needs of birds, but in most cases, we still don't really know the specific causes of species declines. So to be more strategic, we need a better idea of what the limiting factors are, where and when in the annual cycle these are acting. So, yeah, the response to the publication has been huge. There's a lot going on now in bird conservation. And the new science that we're promoting through Road to Recovery is really in the context of other big new opportunities that are in front of us today that, that really weren't present 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. And these are being referred to as the five game changer changers 
by NAPSI, um, things that can help us change business as usual to frame our response to the 3 billion birds loss. So these include this unprecedented coalition that's come together um, after the publication in, a, in a, co a coordinated response. Also a new generation of conservation business plans that can serve as roadmaps for population recovery. Bold new legislation such as Recovering America's Wildlife Act that will hopefully provide a dedicated new funding stream to the states. And even some of our bedrock legislation like Migratory Bird Treaty Act, even if we if we weren't messing with it um, now, I mean, it's 100 years old, this legislation, and it really is not completely effective in protecting birds across the hemisphere. So we really need to rethink that as well. And the unified messaging, such as Seven Simple Actions campaign that, that really has been engaging the public. So one of these game changers is the advances in the science itself, especially technological, methodological advances that are now enabling us to determine the specific causes of, of declines, what we called, referred to as the smoking guns. And this needs to happen on a species by species basis, because even species in the same habitat have different biology and are under different threats throughout their annual cycle. So our approach involves deciding first which species to focus on first because we don't have resources to uh, conserve every species, targeting the research to fill critical knowledge gaps to determine these limiting factors, figuring out how to collect the data we need using new research but also mining existing data sources, and then making sure this new information makes it into the conservation plans and to the managers who can implement these actions on the ground. And we know that implementation is not likely to take place at a species by species scale. We're not advocating for single species conservation, but we need to have essentially these recovery modules for the most urgently declining species, or we're going to continue to lose billions of birds. And we refer to this process, this approach as the road mm -hmm. to recovery. So to identify the highest priority species uh, to apply this road to recovery approach, we looked for species that met three criteria. They need to be already species of high concern. So on the watch list using partners in flights, avian conservation assessment uh, database and process, um, and species that showed steep declines, at least a 50% loss based on our more recent science paper results. And we use these new metrics of urgency, projecting the recent trends forward to see which species are expected to lose another 50% of their population in the near future. And these uh, half-life metrics, as we call them, were first introduced by Partners in Flight in the 2016 Landbird Plan. So this exercise resulted in about 40 species that meet all three criteria based on the data we have and another 34 or so that probably meet, would meet the criteria but are data deficient. And these are the species we think that are most likely to slip into threatened and endangered status in the near future and for which it's imperative that we identify and address the specific causes of decline. And you know, the birds that come out of this process are, are not really a surprise. They're mostly the birds that we've been prioritizing for a while, just to focus on some forest bird examples. So in Eastern forest, these are some of the species that we could consider species on the brink from this process. So golden wing warbler, cerulean warbler, backman sparrow, these are familiar birds, are often been the focus of, of conservation attention in the Eastern forest. Chimney swift is interesting. This is one of many steeply declining aerial insectivores. It's not usually thought of as a forest bird, but originally the habitat for these birds was old growth uh, eastern forests where they nested inside huge uh, hollow trees. And they still do this in places like Congaree National Park and the White River in Arkansas. So I don't know, it's interesting to think about what role forest management could play in the recovery of, of a bird like the chimney swift. And here are some Western forest birds that are uh, in the most serious decline. 
includes several Western hummingbird species and some obscure species like Virginia's warbler that are not really on, on anyone's radar yet. So the next step is we need to assess each species in terms of where they are along this road to recovery. So majority of species, we have little to no information in terms of why they're declining, right? So evening grosbeak, uh, it's a bird that's now, uh, it's an eruption year for them in the Northeast. A lot of us are, are seeing them in our feeders, but in much lower numbers than, than they used to come down. And we really don't have, this is a bird that's lost uh, maybe 90% of its population, and we really don't have um, any idea why they're declining. So other species, such as pinion jay, there's been a working group that's formed, a first draft conservation plan recently released. There's been some research and monitoring, but we still know very little about the specific causes of their decline. Then we have a bird like golden wing warbler, where there's a whole initiative in terms of research, planning on both breeding and wintering grounds, but still don't really know exactly where in the annual cycle these, the species is limited. And then um, I use the example of the saltmarsh sparrow. It's a, obviously not a forest bird, but the recent um, Atlantic Coast Joint Venture uh, business plan for this species um, provides specific management actions and costs to address the key limiting threat for, for this bird, which is thought to be sea level rise. And this, in my mind, is probably the best example of what I would call a recovery plan for a non-endangered, non-game species. And where we're trying to get to is bird like a Kirtland's warbler, where the limiting factors were identified and they were being, they're, they're addressed, the species is in recovery, and it's actually recently been taken off of the U.S. endangered species list. So the important point here is that how this is different from past efforts that to just manage habitat or address broad threats is that we really need to focus on recovery of these populations. And so our goal with this road to recovery approach is to advance species up this pyramid to the point where recovery is happening. And to advance species from one level to another, we need to increase the specific knowledge we have for that species and our understanding of what's causing the declines. So it starts with basic research, filling knowledge gaps, groups of experts coming together, developing these conservation plans. A crucial step is identifying linked populations throughout the annual cycle through studies of migratory connectivity. And to advance further, say from a three to a four in the pyramid, we need to start collecting vital rates for full annual cycle demographic models for these linked populations in order to identify where and when limitation is taking place. And then identify the specific limiting factors acting at those places and time, the what, in order to target specific conservation actions. And finally, develop implementation strategies along with costs in a business planning context to reverse declines and, and recover populations. So that's our pyramid scheme. So to advance the Necessary Science, we hosted a series of workshops that have brought together lots of experts. The first workshop was held in July. It focused on the concepts and approaches for understanding population limitation from uh, some key conservation biologists and, and, and causes of decline. We had more than 100 participants. Our second workshop was just this past December with uh, more than 300 people uh, participating. And it focused on new technologies and methods for identifying linked populations, studying migratory connectivity, collecting the demographic data we need to advance species up the pyramid. And participants in that workshop shared some really exciting new research, such as Landra Stanley's tracking of yellow-billed cuckoos, showing that birds from, from all across the broad breeding range are converging on a relatively small area in the Gran Chaco, in Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, and that this is an area that's being rapidly cleared now for agriculture. So this is something we just didn't know about this declining bird. Or Kristen Rueg's uh, Genescape project, which is really cool, 
taking widespread species and looking for genetic variation in order to be able to define populations that we might manage um, separately. So the purpose of these workshops was to equip the scientific community with the tools to fill knowledge gaps and identify what is causing the population declines and determine where and when limitation is occurring. So I think we need now to go back to some very basic questions if we're going to reimagine bird conservation. Why, after 30 years of partners in flight, all of the work that we've all been doing, have we lost 3 billion birds? Is it really because our science is too imprecise? We don't know what to do, where or when? Well, we argue that this is true for some species. Or is it that even when we do know what to do, and there's so many plans and guidelines out there, the resources and capacity are just not available for the vast majority of species? It's what I call the $45 million question. I mean, we've, we've done a quick estimation that to advance our species on the brink up the pyramid to the point where we have recovery plans to, to implement, just doing that research alone would cost about $45 million over the next 10 years or so. And that seems like a daunting amount of money. But as Bob has pointed out to me, that's the annual allocation uh, to NACA, which really just covers only a portion of waterfowl management for, for 16 species. So who is going to take responsibility or be accountable for bringing back these 3 billion birds. So just as one example, the cerulean warbler was identified as a high priority species by Partners in Flight in the 1990s. 35 states list it as threatened or special concern. There's been working groups, research initiative produced. Uh, it, it was precluded from federal listing because of voluntary efforts. Um, Yet the declines in the most recent decade are still as steep as the long-term decline for this species. So these are some really tough questions for us, for us all. And I know it's uncomfortable. And some people say we're being pretentious to think about reimagining conservation or pointing out these huge resource disparities. But if we don't address these questions and quickly, we're going to continue to lose populations and eventually see more threatened and endangered species. So I just want to now offer uh, a, a couple of high level considerations uh, for us to think about when, um, think about in terms of recovering forest bird populations. The first is this fundamental difference between Eastern and Western forest birds in terms of the land stewardship, uh, who is responsible for, for managing these birds. And th this is a concept that's been, that we've highlighted in couple of past State of the Birds reports that um, you can access. So the map on the left shows the distribution of public lands in the U.S. And we see, of course, that the vast majority of public lands are in the West. So for Western forest birds, species like the pinion jay, highly dependent on public lands management and policy. Yet removal of pinion juniper is still a dominant activity, especially on BLM land. You know, so is this going to be the death knell for the, for the pinion jay? It's already lost nearly 80% of its population. And, 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 and things like fire management are also critical issues across Western public lands. And it's unclear whether this, we're seeing this very recent steep drop in a lot of Western forest bird populations. And we don't know yet whether it's related to uh, the increased frequency of fires. So in the eastern forest, it's very different. Declining species such as the wood thrush um, are highly dependent on private forest land management. And so, of course, things like the economics of industrial forestry are, are very important. And, and the need to interact with millions of small forest owners. Uh, so a very different strategy just overall in terms of approaching the declines of these birds. Another important concept is disturbance. And I know that that's going to be a topic of an upcoming webinar. So the golden wing warbler is typically thought of as a shrubland species and the cerulean, a bird of mature forests. But we now know that both species are dependent on disturbance at different scales. So the golden wing needs young forest patches within a forested 
matrix, and the cerulean needs smaller canopy gaps within the same types of forest. And we know that silviculture can produce these desired conditions for both species. And both are the focal species of large NRCS and other management initiatives and programs across the US. But to manage for both golden wing and cerulean warbler and other forest birds simultaneously, we need to be thinking and implementing at very large landscape scales where both small and large disturbance regimes can be implemented in, in, a, in a shifting mosaic sort of way. And in, in 2005, I was on a paper with Paul Hamill and Dave Bueller, and uh, I think you're gonna see a link to that in the chat. And so in this paper, we pointed out the compatibility of management for cerulean and golden wing warbler in the same landscapes and the compatibility of these habitat needs with commercial forestry and other land uses. But we also pointed out that all of our habitat work for these species on their breeding grounds can still be overwhelmed by threats that these species are facing in tropical forests on the wintering grounds. And so that brings us to the, another big concept, which is the need to be thinking about forest management across the full annual cycle of migratory birds. And this could mean forest managers in the US and Canada collaborating with forest managers in Mexico or even farther south. And there's one example uh, where this is happening is for the Rufus hummingbird. It's a steeply declining species that breeds in the Pacific Northwest and winters in Western Mexico. In both areas, this species um, relies on the profusion of blooming wildflowers that occur post fire. And they can benefit from fire management that promotes the growth of wildflowers as a ground cover. So this is work that's being done through the Western Hummingbird Partnership and Klamath Bird Observatory. And they've produced this report, um, State of the Science and Conservation of Rufus Hummingbirds that describes this collaborative work. So I wanna close um, by having us think about what needs to be different in our concept of forest management for birds. How do we move beyond just managing habitat and this build it and they will come approach and really start focusing on recovering bird populations? This might not be the same actions that are required. It might require management for specific demographic parameters to increase productivity or survival, not just increase bird numbers. But again, we, we, don't, we need to know exactly what the limiting what's limiting the population, where and when that limitation is acting in order to be more targeted in our management. And very importantly, we have to be able to monitor the effectiveness of this management to even know if it's having a population response at, relative, at relevant scales to reverse declines. I mean, how many times have we heard that? So all of these are tough questions It'll be important for us to consider as we hear from the great lineup of experts in the Forest Birds webinars over the next year. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob Ford to moderate any questions that you might have. And I thank you for your attention. Ken, that was that was excellent. We have conversation and hard questions in the chat. Mm -mm. Why well, you get a sip of water there and take a breath? Um, we're getting a few links up in the chat, so I, I suggest that folks can go back into that and, and look at those of interest. We have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, um, no, 15 minutes for questions, and we won't get to all of them. However, we are committed to answering all your questions uh, by email if we don't get them to them today. So go ahead and put those questions in the chat box, even if we can't get to them today. Uh, Ken, you probably won't be surprised. The questions range from global to very, very specific. So let's start with a few of the global kinds of questions first. One, uh, one question was: Could you tell us? Are there studies that's indicating this hap that this population decline crash really is happening in other continents or in countries as well? Is it unique to North America? And and is it does it? And this is. I'll add a little bit to the question and does it very broadly relate to the insect apocalypse kind of studies coming out of Germany a few years ago? Yeah, well, um, so the answer is probably yes, but of course we're 
you know, we're incredibly lucky to have this 50 year data set on bird populations, thanks to Chan Robbins and others who instituted the, the breeding bird survey. So the thing is that we don't have the data in other parts of the world to be able to really compare. Now there have been there have been more limited studies, certainly of farmland birds, grassland birds all around the world are showing comparable declines. State of the birds reports around the world are reporting declines and reporting, you know, high degrees of threats and increased endangerment, but there really isn't the data to, to compare it numerically. And then, yeah, again, the, these um, simultaneous reports of, of insect population decline largely coming out of Europe, I think. So um, they're undoubtedly related. Birds are very visible and very obvious, but we, we think that uh, what's happening with bird populations are probably happening across, you know, many segments of biodiversity, but also are signaling these changes in, in the overall environment that are affecting us, of course. So, um, you know, we think yes, but we there really isn't the data comparable to what we have in North America right now. And Ken, uh, bringing it to North America, uh, there's a couple of questions about basically about content of the habitat and structure versus the context of the landscape. And uh, that will be a subject of one of our talks later in the year. But would you say a little bit more about whether you think these population, and, and this was right at the beginning of your second section, and we all know you said that so many of these answers are unknown right now, and that's what we have to get to the answers. But would you elaborate a little bit on uh, whether the population declines are within forests based on habitat structure and content, or is it you think it's more based on the overall loss of forest land, that is the configuration of forests across the landscape, and they're very fragmented as compared to to what it may have used to be. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, <laughs> I hope we get, I'll give you my waffly scientist answer there. Uh, I hope we get closer to that answer through this webinar series. I mean, the truth is, and we know that we don't have, it's really hard to get good large scale data on land use change. That's something the bird conservation community has been really struggling with. And I know a couple of groups, and I think we might hear about uh, one of these in a in a later webinar by John Alexander. I know that some groups right now are, are trying to pin down that question, to try to use BBS data to see what's happening in the landscapes around those BBS routes and, and is it a total loss of habitat or is it a change in the configuration? That's still a basic question. Um, and even, I mean, I don't know of any studies that have really tried to correlate side by side the, the the loss of have of outright loss of habitat uh, with the declines of birds. We think it's probably more closely a one to one match for grassland birds, but we certainly know for forests that forest cover overall has not decreased. In fact, in the northeastern U.S., it's increased at the same time that a lot of these populations have continued to decline. So that alone, there's the hypothesis: is that it's it's the quality, it's the condition, it's the configuration of the forest and not just the, the total amount of forest that's driving the declines for some of these birds. But maybe for a bird like red Iberia, that's all they care about. So, um, you know, so yeah, so still a lot, a lot to learn. I had several questions. I'm going to try my best to combine them and accurately represent the, the viewers who ask, but um, it's about the birds who have increased and and first a program kind of question and you hit on this just a little bit with NACA, but wetland birds are increasing. Do you think that's a direct result of the focus of legislative and incentive programs for wetlands that helped increase those birds? And can we replicate that in uplands? Yeah, I mean it has to be. The 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 duck people are very humble when you ask them about that and they say it's it's just luck you know it happened to rain in 1970 when all these programs uh, came about and the and and so the end of the drought but they'll also point out that that putting all that habitat on the ground and conserving all those wetlands and restoring all those wetlands millions of acres the, the land was ready for the for when the the drought ended and those birds 
were able to come back. And so that really is the big question. And what I was referring to in the terms of the disparity of resources is if we could put that kind of resources into grassland birds or into certain forest birds, um, you know, we have to be able to see some impact of that. Um, so that's that's definitely the, the big question is how do we replicate that success for these other habitats and these other groups of birds? Stepping that down more specifically to groups of birds again, um, there's a question about uh, that wondered about your thoughts in terms of raptors increasing. And it seems like we often get headlines about those birds when they decline or we hear about raptor rehab stations. Uh, sounds like gloom and doom, but on the other hand, uh, the population seems to be increasing. Can you give some yeah, insight? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one because raptors almost across the board are are increasing. And of course, a big part of it is uh, recovery from the tremendous loss that these birds suffered uh, through, with DDT. So, you know, the recovery of eagles and ospreys and, and, and other birds is, you know, whether we, whether we're back to historic numbers or even surpassing just from that, I don't know. But the other big thing that's happened are the laws that are, that are pre preventing the persecution of these raptors. I mean, it used to be so commonplace just for people to be shooting every hawk they saw, and, and that has essentially stopped because uh, every state has these birds listed as protected and special concern. And this is really different from everywhere else in the world where, where they're still shooting raptors. And so these birds at the top of the food chain that you would think should be more sensitive and declining, those are actually the ones doing really well in North America right now, um, which is in contrast to um, elsewhere around the world. And the other thing that, of course, has happened is that these birds have are becoming urban birds. And we're seeing that in species after species, the famous red-tailed hawks nesting on buildings and Cooper's hawks came into the cities about 30 years ago and Merlins are doing it now. So something, you know, interesting is happening evolutionarily is triggered in, in these raptors that are able to live side by side with people. And if they're not being shot, then there's plenty of food. And yeah, they're, they're, they're all increasing through the roof. Uh, one more population increase question. Would you like to elaborate on the virios increasing? <laughs> what was your theory, Bob? Uh, you had one. <laughs> yeah, I posed this the question. Was listening, to listen to you. <laughs> I think it's the hook on their beak. I mean, actually, yeah, it's a, I don't know that to me, that's one of the biggest, biggest mysteries. And, you know, what is it about, about Red Iberia? I was telling Bob though, that uh, this past summer at the NAOC meeting, there was a, a talk by a student and maybe, maybe she's participating here. I don't know, working with the Biodiversity Research Institute in Maine on mercury contamination and was looking at mercury loads across a whole suite of forest birds, and they all had pretty high levels of mercury, except for one species, and it was the red Iberia, which did not show any mercury contamination. So, you know, they didn't say it, but I thought, wow, that, that's pretty interesting. Maybe, maybe there's something like that going on that we don't even have any idea, you know, that's affecting a lot of birds, but, but not others. And maybe there's something about red Iberias that make them more you know, tolerant of, of these contaminants and things like that. Very cool. Thanks, Ken. There are several questions that I'll lump into one big one, and lots of folks want to know a little bit more about one-stop shopping for uh, where can I go to find my priority species, the vulnerability assessment, various lists, and any part of the country? Well, um, you know, the the Probably the best one-stop shopping place would be the Partners in Flight, the Avian Conservation Assessment Database, and that could be accessed through the Partners in Flight website, but also directly through the ACAD um, website. And you know, like a lot of these things, it's it's constantly in flux. We're in the uh, process of updating a lot of the scores and and lists. Um, but just very recently, the, uh, there's been a new version of the global species assessment was just published up on the ACAD site. And um, 
And this, of course, forms the basis of the Birds of Conservation Concern for Fish and Wildlife Service. A lot of the state uh, species of greatest conservation need, you know, came basically out of this same assessment process. So I would say contact the Partners in Flight Coordinator, Bob Ford, and he could uh, connect you with um, all of these various resources. I can indeed, and I welcome that. Thanks, Ken. Um, we're getting again lots of lots of good questions and trying to put these together in a related way. While we're thinking about species lists and priority, there's a there's a question about umbrella species. Is there an umbrella species designated for each of these areas that we can focus on? Uh, for instance, breeding areas from breeding time is made October, so it's advised to reduce forest land management during those time frames. Do you mind saying a little bit about uh, umbrella, the use of umbrella species and where they stand around the country? Yeah, well, I mean, there's been a lot of attempts to to put out these umbrella species and focal species and um, ideas, and a lot of them are not really proven or not really based on um, a lot of data. And I think one of the things that we're seeing now kind of kind of goes counter to that is that each species has its individual um, threats and limiting factors. And we might be able to address them collectively once we know, but even among, you know, a group of grassland birds, you have one bird migrating to Argentina and others going to Mexico and some staying year round in the US. So, you know, we don't know, we don't really know that any of these species can serve as an umbrella for others. I mean, they can in very general ways in terms of representing the habitat and Partners in Flight has used that approach to identify focal species that should represent the greatest needs of these birds. But in terms of reversing the declines, um, we don't know if that's true. And, and I think we're also getting more and more of an idea that, that this, this notion that, you know, what's good for waterfowl is going to be good for other birds or what's good for certain game species is going to benefit other birds. You know, we've been operating on those assumptions and we're still seeing these losses. So I think in my, in my mind, we have a lot of work to do before we really know what umbrella species might work in those situations. Somewhat related, Ken, is a question about scale. At what scale should priority species be selected? Should there be regional and sub-regional species of concern? And I'll add, um, if so, how did we get there? Well, that, that is what's being done. We, through this um, assessment process, we start at the global scale, and then there, there's a regional assessment that's done at the scale of, of BCRs, bird conservation regions. And every state has its own priority species list, and every joint venture has its own priority species list that are, that are basically derived from the same data. So within the Partners in Flight assessment, when you get down to the regional level, um, there's a whole rule set really for, you know, is this a bird that's globally uh, important? And then, you know, is it is it found in my region? And then are there other birds that are really highly threatened or declining regionally that might not be um, a concern globally? And those can be added in then as a regional concern here. And all of this is um, you can you can find that in the avian conservation assessment database, and there's a handbook that that can be downloaded that explains how we identify regional concern species, how we identify regional stewardship species, also because you know we really want to be addressing the needs of these birds where they're most abundant, you know, and that's kind of counterintuitive. A lot of States will list the birds that are rare in their state and not really focus much on the most abundant birds. But in some cases, it could be that what's really important is to focus on the abundant birds because you have most of their population. Ken, probably time for one more if it's, uh, um, well, you can answer any of these in a, in a full uh, webinar, but if it's relatively short, we have time for one more. How would uh, we go about correlating population declines with habitat change? We have both the habitat change data and the survey data. So what's next? 
Yeah, well, it's the person asking, do they say they have those data? Um, in the cases I'm where I know, yeah, in the cases where I know people are are trying that, so it's it's really a matter of linking spatially the the what's going on on the BBS routes with what's going on in the landscape around those. That's really the first step. Um, you know, so is the, is the decline correlated with a loss of habitat or other land use changes that are going on or not? I mean, it's a pretty basic question, but that kind of spatial analysis, I mean, one of the barriers to that is that the BBS data is still not available on a stop-by-stop -stop basis. You have to use the entire route, so that's kind of a pretty coarse tool. Um, and there's been some local and regional studies like that, but I think doing it across the range of whole species is really what has to happen next. Very good, Ken. Uh, we have just a couple minutes before our hour is up, so I believe that does it. We thank you very much for taking your time, Ken. I want to thank everyone for their excellent, excellent questions, for sharing links, for sharing comments. There were way too many for us to get to all of the questions today. As I said, though, we hope to uh, flesh those out in email and answer by email. Uh, Ken and I will take a look at the questions and uh, try to find uh, the best answers for you and get them to you. I want to remind people, too, that the next webinar will be Tuesday, April 20th at 1 Eastern. Matthew Betts, Oregon State University, will be discussing forest birds and disturbance ecology. Ken hit on that today, and of course, Matthew and, uh, will go into much more detail. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. That's the end of our first webin webinar for Forest for the Birds, and we look forward to seeing you monthly for the next, for the next year. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Nice, Ken. Perfect.